Hi, my name is Jeff Minter. I'm a designer and programmer for LlamaSoft, and uh, we're here to talk about Akar. Can you talk about like the history of this game? Because it was a game that was practically done almost to completion, and then it just never came out. Like, what was going on with that? Basically, the story goes that they developed this game, Akar. It was very nearly finished, and they put it out on field tests. And the response in field tests wasn't very good. And so rather than spend the time to polish up the game and maybe make it better and make it good enough to release, I think they just thought they'd cut their losses and uh, and just uh, ax the game. So it never came out, which is a bit of a shame. Now, when you say field test, because they, they did this, I'm familiar with like Midway's process of field testing, but not Atari's. Like they would put the arcade cabinet in like certain locations to see how well it would perform and get feedback. Or was it like, do you think that played kind of a role in its in its quote failure because they put it in a bad area or something like that? No, it's something that Atari used to do with with all their coin-op games. Basically, in the early days, they had certain arcades near to where their headquarters were, where they would place these these arcade games. They'd uh, have people go down and watch the games being played. They'd uh, they'd be interviewing people after they'd played about what they thought about the game, and they'd be checking the earnings and the week-on-week -week earnings of these of these games. And they could more or less tell from that if a game was worth pursuing or if a game was not. And unfortunately, Akar just fell on the, the negative end of that, really. Where did the name come from, Akar? Because even like reading it without without having someone say it, it's hard to pronounce it unless you hear someone say it first. I always think that Akar, it's, it sounds like somebody somebody with a cold, you know, somebody with a cough or something. Akar. But apparently it comes from the, uh, uh, it's a, a, constructed from the names of the original designers. I can't remember their names now, but apparently their names smushed together and made this Aka R. And like, this is being re-released. Like, how does it feel to see this game come back to life after like 30 years? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I think they, they just thought, because because I, I've done updates to their games before. I did a game called Tempest 2000 on the Atari Jaguar years ago. And I think they thought maybe I could, yeah, but what it was, they offered me the chance to do an update of any of the games from, from their back catalogue, basically. They sent me their back catalogue and they and said, go through that. If you fancy doing anything, let us know and we can sort something out. And I went through and I'd heard the story of this Aka R. And I'd actually, there's another story about how the ROMs got released that's quite amusing. Uh, there, there's, there were only three Aka R games were ever made. And, then, and I think. There's a collector, who, I'm not sure if, it, if it's known where all of them are, but there was one collector who had a working game and refused to release the ROMs to emulation. So the only place you could play it was if you went to a place where he was exhibiting this thing. And uh, somebody who was helping him maintain his game managed to surreptitiously copy the ROMs and release them to emulation. And um, I found out about this when it happened. And of course, I downloaded the ROMs and checked it out for myself. I was quite fascinated to hear about you know, this mythical game, which you could now have a look at. And it was quite an intriguing game. I liked the, I liked the look of the game. It had a nice sort of geometric playing surface. It looked a bit like a Lotus. It was very you know, abstract and, and interesting looking. And the game mechanic was quite interesting. And so when I was offered the chance to do anything from Atari's back catalogue and that was there, I thought, well, actually, I'd be quite interested to try that. So maybe I could take this game and update it and polish it up a little bit so that it make it slightly better than it was when it was failing uh, field test and see what we could make of it. Now, how do you go about doing something like that from a creative perspective? Like, how do you want to change? You don't want to change too much, but you do want to, like, modernize it in a way without losing what its core principles were. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to keep the shape of it. Um, I, with Tempest, it was easier because I was starting with the Stone Cold Classic. Uh, but with something like this, where it started from a slightly dodgy start, really, where it's a failed game in the past, and I'm trying to bring it forward into modern times and make it good, it's a bit more effort. And it did actually take me quite a long time and it, uh, quite a lot of experimentation before I got it to the stage where I thought, actually, this is now quite good and I'm quite happy with it. There were times where I was thinking, bloody, I'm never going to be able to do that. But. Uh, because it, it, it is a transformative thing anyway to bring it from the arcade to a home iteration because in the arcade the game's got to be very fierce because it's trying to kick you off and get you to put a new quarter in every every, th every three minutes whereas at home players tend to want a longer session you want to be able to settle in and have a good old game you don't want to be restarting your game every three minutes so there's a change in pace which which has to be engineered into it and a change in the feel which has to go along with bringing it into a home version and 
I, I had to cut a bit more deeply into the design in order to fix this to make it into what I think is a nice home game that I would have done with Tempest, as I say, because because it came from a flawed original. But I, it, I say, it took me a while; it took me nearly a year to get it right. But I think I did get it right in the end. I was, I've got it right to my satisfaction. Whether or not it's to everybody else's satisfaction remains to be seen. Can you host your? You, there's is there someone else with you? Am I doing? Is there another person I'm supposed to be talking to? I just want to be clear, or is that just like a like no, a the, colleague? This is Ivan here. We, we are basically llamas off between the two of us. <laughs> I, I, everybody tends to talk to me because I'm I founded Llamasoft in 1982 and he didn't join until 2003. But we are very much a coding team together. Uh, he does a lot of the of the engine work. I always say he he builds the horse and I get to ride it. So uh, yeah, I'll do all the poor things for the various consoles. Yeah, he's super busy right now because I mean I'm, I'm, I finished the game quite a long time ago and he's been working on ports for months now. Yeah. It's, 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 we're having it on like, six different platforms, is it? Well, all of them, yeah. <laughs> except the VR systems at all. So uh, yeah, he's been quite busy. Like speak, like you're, you're to port to so many systems now. Like, which do you have a preferred preference? Is, is, are some easier than others? I know PC ports can be well, the most challenging because they have so many different specs. They are all different. I mean, the the say is it's kind of interesting. It's kind of frustrating because you are doing something that's like. It would appear like doing the same jobs a number of times, but in reality, you're doing completely different things every time. And the big challenge is try to create something like we've done. And we, we call it our engine. I don't know if we could you exactly call it engine, but we have to see an environment now where the game can kind of fit in it in an independent way, and everything below it uh, adapts to the various different architectures. So it's a, a really multi platform now, more than we had before. But for, for example, even recently I've done the Xbox stuff. The Xbox has changed uh, the, the type of graphics they were using. And so basically I had to redo completely from scratch, from zero, brand new, all the new iteration of our engine. It's designed specifically for Xbox. Uh, it wasn't anything like that before. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you learn a lot of the complex things, but at the same time, it's a bit it makes you worry because there is so much stuff that you have to do. and that people take for granted that it's so simple and works. In reality, it's so complex to make it work. Uh, we, we actually started on the PC, so we got the, like the, the hardest version done first. Would you say the PC was the hardest version? Well, the PC has a lot of uh, intrinsic it's things, a, yeah. It's the video modes, the I mean, controls, the keyboards, the different... One of the things I, one of the things I did to, uh, to, to help test the game, I bought one of these 32 by 9, 165 hertz monitors. Uh, <laughs> Got the game working on there because yeah that's the kind of thing on the pc you need to be able to to, to deal with these people have all these weird shaped monitors and the game needs to be able to adapt to the different shapes of the monitors and different refresh rates people are going to be using and that was a bit of extra work at the outset but it's well worth doing because now we can support just about anything yeah